you know, we owe it to young people to explain exactly what the situation is. And they need to be involved in the decision making because it's they're the ones who are inheriting the consequences. They come over decades and even centuries, but we should be able to understand what they are going to be and make some sensible decisions because we have to reduce this planetary energy imbalance. It's never been this large. It's never been driving the planet at the rate that it is now. And it's going to have consequences on the decadal timescale, which are going to be very large. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Climate Emergency Forum. And we have the pleasure today of being able to chat with uh, Dr. James Hansen about his very, very recent paper, just came out, I believe, November 1st, Global Warming in the Pipeline. And um, I also want to point you to a press release uh, video, which is available on the web to watch with James and some other scientists talking about some of the findings of, of the paper. So, you know, this paper is obviously, I think it's a landmark paper. I think it's very clearly pointing out that the IPCC has basically lost the thread and they're way too conservative for a multitude of reasons. You know, their ideas of climate sensitivity and how much warming we can expect to occur over the next, uh, even, even over the next five to 10 years, moving above beyond that. We're in for a big surprise. People on the planet are in for a huge surprise. I think people are getting more concerned over the last few years based on the extreme weather events that they're seeing happen, based on uh, ocean temperatures, for example, in the Southern Hemisphere being around Antarctica, being five or six sigma standard deviations above and beyond what we've ever seen, the collapse of Antarctic sea ice. And there's reasons for this. There's good scientific reasons for this. And um, we're going to uh, try to delve into some of these reasons in a bit of detail uh, with James today. So James, why did you do this paper? What was the main reason for this update, this paper and this work? Well, I, I was invited by the editor-in-chief of Oxford Open Climate Change to write what he called the perspective article based on his reading of something that I had written as a preface for a book uh, edited by Dominic Della Sala on uh, conservation, on censorship and conservation. And uh, in that uh, preface, I complained about what I considered to be censorship by the IPCC. With uh, a number of colleagues, I had written a paper which is titled Ice Melt, Sea Level Rise, and Superstorms, published it in 2016. That paper actually had a 10-year gestation period. I had asked Rado Rudy to run some experiments in which we put fresh water, injected it on the North Atlantic Ocean and the Southern Ocean around Antarctica, based on uh, observations of the rate of melting. In the case of Antarctica, Eric Rigneau is the expert on the ice shelves, and he had published estimates for the rate at which they were losing uh, mass. And uh, that was confirmed, actually, by the remarkable uh, satellite data for how the, the sea level, the slope of sea level, away from Antarctica had increased, which was an indication of freshwater injection. And the implication was consistent with Renault's estimate of freshwater loss. And around Greenland, we had data on how much the sea ice had shrunk, implying a freshwater injection, and the Greenland ice sheet had lost some mass and the ice caps uh, and the small island ice caps. So anyway, this was based on observed estimates for freshwater injection. And we found that, and we assumed that going into the future, the rate of ice melt would increase exponentially 
with characteristic times of 10 years or 20 years or even 40 years, we don't know how fast that is, but we know that it's going to be exponential because we have from paleoclimate history evidence for how fast ice sheets melt when they do melt. And in particular, during the Eemian, which was about one degree Celsius warmer than the Holocene, the sea level suddenly went up by a few meters, which was a clear indication that the West Antarctic ice sheet collapsed. And this occurred in less than a century. So with the forcing that we're, humans are applying to the system, uh, if an ice sheet begins to go, it's going to go rapidly. So anyway, when we first got this result, you know, I wonder, well, why doesn't, why don't the other models get this? And so I was suspicious that our model had a problem. And it took me a long time to persuade myself that we were actually getting the right answer. And we, we benefited from the fact that our a model had been put together by genius, uh, Gary Russell, who could understand the whole model, including the ocean model and the atmospheric model. Uh, but then more recently, Max Kelly, has taken over the GIS model. And the model has become more and more complex as you add these different physical processes into the model. But Max is an incredible genius and he understands the whole model. He found some problems with the ocean model and error in the code and, and he improved the small scale mixing. And so then, and we ran the model and got the same answer. The AMOC, the Atlantic, meridional overturning circulation would shut down this century, possibly by mid-century, and sea level rise could be several meters this century, or if it's a 20-year doubling time, then it may be early next century. But in any case, the threats of shutting down both the AMOC and the Southern Ocean, the deep water formation that occurs around Antarctica. That also shut down in our model with realistic melt rates. And uh, so, so, we, so we finally, I had courage to submit the paper and I submitted it to a journal that has the public open review. So you publish the submitted right. paper, you publish the reviews of the, the referees, and well, we had two referees. One was an IPCC lead author, and one was David uh, Archer, who wrote a, a very positive review. The IPCC author wrote many, many pages, and it's clear he's never going to be happy with the paper. So they, <laughs> yeah. gave, they gave it to two more referees, both of whom agreed it should be published. And the editor, in, you know, he knew it was going to be a controversial paper, so yeah. he hmm. he also looked at it. He, he and wanted, so it was right. accepted. So this right. this passed peer review, but then the editorial board decided they wanted to get involved, and they said that I needed to change the title. I couldn't say that mm. two degrees Celsius is dead, basically. Extremely dangerous. Two degrees cel Celsius mm. is extremely dangerous. I had to change it to say two degrees Celsius could be dangerous, mm -hmm. which is a very innocuous. <laughs> right. It's to totally different. So let me ask you, I mean, just uh, a couple of days ago, you published a, a letter on your, your website, how we know that global warming is accelerating and that the goal of the Paris Agreement is dead. Right. That was a very interesting sort of follow up to your paper. And before we get into the causes for this great acceleration, uh, which looks like it's a primarily the aerosols, which is primarily the, how it affects the clouds, the, the indirect component of the aerosols. There was a passage in your note which says, it, it looks at basically in 2010, if we were 0.95 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial, pre-industrial, of course, we're not defining it as 1750, it's the 1880 to 1920 average. And then that's arguable in itself, whether we should be doing that. But by 2030, you're expecting maybe 1.71 degrees Celsius by the, by the late 2030. So that's in about 15 years to reach that two degrees Celsius number. And 
you know, if you look just at 2023, we've got a month and a half to go, but it looks like the global average temperature for 2023 is going to be something like 1.54 Celsius already. So clearly, you know, I think the acceleration is very, very rapid. And you're attributing it mostly to the reduction of sulfur in, in shipping fuels. So could you go into that a little bit more? Yeah, we have this satellite measurements, the series instrument, which is basically Earth radiation budget. It measures the reflected solar light and the emitted thermal emission by the planet. And what it shows is that coincident with the change in the regulations on ship fuels, the amount of absorbed solar radiation has increased by at least one watt per meter square. So that tells us, you know, people are wondering, well, what could be causing this apparent rapid warming in this year? Well, some of the mechanisms that are proposed, for example, they say the volcano, the large volcano in the South Pacific, that will that put water vapor in the stratosphere? What would that do? That would reduce the thermal emission to space but it would not do anything to the incoming solar radiation except reduce it a little bit. But in fact, what's happening is the amount of absorbed solar energy has increased. And that's what you would expect from the effect of decreased aerosols on cloud formation and cloud brightness, cloud cover and cloud brightness. A one watt increase in the solar absorption is equivalent to increasing CO2 from 420 to 500 ppm suddenly. And so the imbalance, the planet's energy imbalance has increased from 10 or 15 years ago, it's about six tenths of a watt per meter square. Well, now it's at least doubled from that. And so the rate of warming of the planet is going to increase. I mean, it's the amount that imbalance is what drives global warming and that imbalance has been doubled so the rate of warming is going to increase and you can look at the response function of any climate model and they'll show you that you get about half of the response within a decade or so so that increase of one watt is going to give us a substantial warming of the order of half a degree. Yeah, it seems that the Earth energy imbalance is really the key metric. And I, it's easy for people to understand the Earth energy imbalance. I mean, if there's more energy coming in than going out, then that energy, the Earth has to heat up. There's, there's no two ways about it. There's no controversy, right? So getting accurate numbers on that Earth energy imbalance is, is, is very important. And uh, you know, you've done the calculations with the International Maritime Organization tightening the restrictions on sulfur in 2015, and then they tightened it, or, or they put in restrictions on sulfur in shipping fuels in 2015, and then they tightened those restrictions in 2020, and that seems to coincide precisely with uh, where the warming acceleration is occurring. So, yeah, you know, but, I'm, but I'm just, you know, you should you note know, that. So there are papers that have been written about that. They, they look at the change in the sulfur emissions and they estimate a one-tenth of one watt effect. Well, there's about an order of magnitude discrepancy with what we're observing. So it's just an example, I think, of where the, the modeling has not, is not yet realistic. And right. that's a little bit related to the climate sensitivity issue too, because yeah. what's happening with climate sensitivity, when um, I was invited to write this uh, perspective paper, I started getting into the literature and I realized that a 40 year mystery had been solved. 40 years ago, when at the time of the Charney report, in 1979, and then the Ewing Symposium on Climate Sensitivity in 1982, our model was predicting that doubled CO2 would give four degrees, and some other models predicted two degrees. 
when we looked at paleoclimate, the data was just becoming available from the ice cores tell, telling us how much the greenhouse gases had changed. And we, we knew from geologic data how the size of the ice sheets had changed. And when we ran our model with changed greenhouse gases and ice sheets, if we used the sea surface temperatures that the climate project provided, then we would get global cooling during the ice age of three and a half degrees, but the planet would be out of ba energy balance by at least two watts, implying that the model was trying to cool it off more. It was saying that the sea surface temperatures were not consistent, at least with the, the physics in our climate model. And we had good reason to suspect that the climate project was underestimating the sea surface temperature change because they based it on the assumption that the biology in the ocean surface, the, the microscopic life in the ocean surface would migrate to stay within the temperatures that it prefers today. But what if over millennia, this microscopic biology can adapt? So then maybe it, it, the temperature change was actually larger than three and a half degrees. Well, recently, Jessica Tierney published a paper in which she did not use this biologic data. Instead, she just used chemical tracers. And she found that the ice age was about six degrees colder, not three and a half degrees. And her postdoc, uh, Matt Osman, looked at the narrow 18 to 21K thousand years ago, right. the, 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 temperature. The, right. the, the peak of the last glacial maximum and found it was seven degrees colder. Well, that implies a sensitivity, which is much higher, more like 4.8 degrees, plus or minus 1.2 degrees, uh, two sigma uncertainty. And that in turn implies, well, clouds must be a larger feedback because they're, they're the one big uncertain feedback. And there were models in the last IPCC report, a number of models were finding sensitivities of the order of five degrees for double CO2. And yeah. as we showed in our webinar, those models with the high sensitivity actually have a more realistic seasonal latitudinal dependence of the clouds as compared to the models with low sensitivity. So there's a lot of evidence in support of a um, high climate sensitivity. And I, I think the problem, I, I mean, I, I agree completely. I mean, I think the problem with the global climate models is the modelers kind of fell in love a bit too much with their models. And they thought, hey, the models are right. And in order to force the models to kind of show what was happening, they needed to have a low climate sensitivity and a low aerosol effect. And of course, clearly now we have lots of, you call it, well, paleo, we have a lot of paleo data on actually how much temperature changed in the past over what periods of time in the previous ice ages, et cetera. And we also have more and more data on clouds. And as you say, the, the high equilibrium climate sensitivity is absolutely matching. When you use that, it matches the clouds generated, the cloud patterns generated match the observations where the low, whereas the low equilibrium climate sensitivity just doesn't match the data at all. So I have to ask you, is it just one guy at the International Maritime Organization sitting in his office saying, hey, let's take sulfur out of shipping fuels? And then in 2015, and then in 2020, well, let's take more of it out and have tighter restrictions because we can and the air will be cleaner, you know, with no thought to any repercussions. I mean, I imagine Homer Simpson running the show, you know, and, and sort of thing. Well, so, no, they, they have good reasons. I mean, they, they're right. The number of people who die from uh, air pollution is enormous, it's actually in the millions per year. And that's, that's actually a tiny fraction of the people who are affected by air pollution. So there, there's very good reasons to reduce particulate air pollution. But yeah. uh, it does have a climate effect. That's what I call called decades ago the Faustian bargain. Yeah, uh, we're 
keeping the planet cooler, but uh, we're going to have to pay the bill at some time when we decide we don't like that pollution. Pay the piper. And it seems, um, you know, the sources of, of aerosols over land are, are numerous and the, the particle counts are very, very high over land. Over the ocean, you have pristine environment. So it seems to me that the, as you were saying, that the effect of aerosols being produced over the ocean in shipping fuels is an enormous effect. I mean, I think you were talking about regional effects of something like three watts per square meter, which is incredible warming, you know, over those well, oceans. So, so that's to be determined. You see, I okay. think that the models are very strongly influenced by what they think they need. So the aerosols effect in the GCMs is relatively small, but what's causing this sudden increase of absorbed solar by at least one watt per meter squared? So it's 10 times greater than what their yeah. models are saying. I mean, have so we seen effects? Yeah, have we seen effects from, from the El Nino? We're in a powerful El Nino. There's usually a lag in global temperature from when the El Nino starts. You know, it's usually the following year, as you pointed out, in several graphs and publications, et cetera. We're a few months into the El Nino warming, but the magnitude of the observed warming is, is you know, is off the scale. It's much larger than you would expect due to the El Nino alone. Right. And I think it's the combination. So I, I expect that the 12-month average global temperature is going to rise to at least 1.6 or 1.7. And then as the El Nino fades, it will go down a few tenths of a degree, but it's not going right. to go down nearly to where it was, in which case our, the average over the El Nino La Nina is going to already be one and a half degrees. And within a decade or so, it, it will probably be two degrees. Do you think that, um, you know, once a strong El Nino occurs and it drives the temperature up, yeah, if you look at the past El Ninos, the temperature has never gone back down to where it was before that El Nino hit. It, we seem to be notched up at a higher level. Do you think that the reason is, that, is that we've kicked in some of these earth feedbacks? I mean, I have to ask you about methane because you and Nesbitt did a press release about a week ago, and he was talking, asking the question, are are we in a termination zero methane event? And what he means by that is if you look at the end of all the ice ages in the past, as we go to rapid warming, there's a big jump in methane levels in the atmosphere, a big, big jump, like four, 500, 700 parts per billion, something like that. So what he's looking at is he plotted the data of what the methane concentration in the atmosphere is doing right now against some of the previous so-called methane termination events, and they match up. It matches up very nicely, but even more importantly, the isotopic ratio of methane has been falling, and it's been falling usually, you know, with more and more fossil fuels emitted, that del-13 carbon isotopic ratio increases. And be, because it's falling in this case, what he's arguing is that methane from tropical wetland is just taking off like crazy. And it's dwarfing, actually it's starting to dwarf human methane emissions, if that's the case. And it's sort of like tracking the isotopic del-13 ratio is kind of tracking what's happened in previous methane termination events. So the, the big difference is we're not coming out of an ice age. We're in a very warm period. He's arguing that maybe the characteristics of the methane are notching us that to a much, much higher, warmer level. And that has a component in the warming that you're talking about, you know, the, the, the massive warming. So I guess the question is, is, do we know that the massive acceleration of warming is mostly due to the, the sulfur, the aerosols, or can a big component of it also be, start being due to, to methane? I guess that's the question. Yeah, well, we know very well exactly what methane is contributing. If you look at our colorful diagram uh, right. for the different gases, you'll see that CO2 is most of it. Methane is, however, has begun to grow again, and it's now a significant contributor. But it's not so that the decadal increase of greenhouse gas forcings is about 0.4 to 0.5 
watts, of which methane is more than 10%, but it's not the dominant thing. So in comparison, this sudden increase in absorbed solar is equal to more than a 20 year increase of all the greenhouse gases, methane, nitrous oxide, chlorofluorocarbon, CO2, they increase the forcing only about 0.4 to 0.5 watts per decade. Well, we've suddenly added on top of that one full watt. Yeah. Now, it, mm. yeah, it, you know, it remains to be proven what this is, but I think it's yeah. pretty clear it's due to decreased cloud albedos. And th those have a large natural variability, but nevertheless, we, we've now seen it for several years. So it's hard to believe that. And in fact, yeah. it's, we're in a phase of the Pacific decadal oscillation, which should be going the other way. So yeah. boy, it looks like we're doing an enormous inadvertent experiment and uh, we'd better do our best to understand exactly what that's doing to the aerosols, to the clouds, and to the planet's uh, energy balance. Yeah, you know, I guess you know, with the with these shipping fuels again. I mean, that's something that uh, you know, maybe we're cutting back on sulfur and shipping fuels too quickly because these warming effects are much more. You know, I, I don't know. I guess it's not like a decision yeah. was made for the climate. Let's cut back on sulfur and shipping fuels. Yeah, a decision no, was made. They, they had the capability and the technology to do it. So they just went ahead and did it, right? And now we're seeing yeah. that it may be changing the whole planet, basically. Yeah, it's an inadvertent uh, geological engineering or whatever you call it. But geoengineering, the, we're, yeah. We're geoengineering. Yeah. Uh, we're we're going to have to look at the bigger picture uh, of all the things we're doing. And, you know, we owe it to young people to explain exactly what the situation is. And they need to be involved in the decision-making because it's they're the ones who are inheriting the consequences. They come over decades and even centuries, but we should be able to understand what they are going to be and make some sensible decisions because we have to reduce this planetary energy imbalance. It's never been this large. It's never been driving the planet at the rate that it is now, and it's going to have consequences on the decadal time scale, which are going to be very large. I mean, the, the Earth energy imbalance, it's a key to, to everything, basically. And if you look at the value, right, the, the last values I saw for it was something approaching two watts per square meter. You know, on a very short time scale, yeah. Yeah, 1.97. I mean, if you take, you know, you show in many of your plots and your both your global warming in the pipeline paper, but also even in this note that you put on your website a couple of days ago, the average from like 2020 to 2023, beginning of the year, you know, is what that 1.47 or whatever. But, and then if you look on the real time plot, well, we're approaching two. So that number is showing no sign of stabilizing. That earth imbalance, energy imbalance is still you know, next time you do a three-year average or whatever, it's going to be much higher than what you've got so far. So the acceleration of warming is accelerating itself, if you like. Yeah, you have to be careful on uh, on short time scales. Um, and yeah. we do have, the sun is adding to that. It's now at or near its solar maximum. But its contribution is probably at most a few tenths of one watt. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we have to keep our eye on that. And it's certainly very worrisome. This has not occurred before in the period of satellite data of more than 20 years. Yeah. I mean, I mean, how worried are you? You know, human emissions continue to go up, but, you know, it looks like we might be triggering feedback so that we're getting, you know, more and more emissions from different Earth systems, you know, whether it be the wetlands or whether it be a, a decrease of the, the ocean sink, for example, those very, very warm ocean temperatures in the Southern hemisphere, you know, the reduction of vertical mixing in the ocean from very stratification, very warm water, all of these factors could suddenly make things a lot worse for us. Basically, these are earth responses to the warming that we've put in. The one that is yeah. relevant to the discussion of the Earth's energy imbalance is the reduction of southern hemisphere sea ice. 
that is, of course, increasing the absorption of solar radiation. And the season is just now changing to the point where there's more sunlight incident on the Southern Ocean. So I have not made the uh, calculation for the contribution of that. It's not it's not quite a trivial uh, calculation, but mm-hmm. I've encouraged other people to look at that because it may be adding to this short-term uh, spike in the planet's energy imbalance. It, it seems uh, like a very strong possibility because the 2 million square kilometers of missing Antarctic sea ice is of course at the edges of the ice. So it's at actually a, a much higher latitude than the ice that's missing in, in the Arctic, right? And people have been worried about the Arctic sea ice decline and also not so much, but it's as big a factor as the lack of snow cover on land in the Arctic in the spring months. That's almost having an equal effect to the Arctic temperature amplification as the missing sea ice is having. So those things combined cause this huge Arctic temperature amplification, which is arguably slowing the jet streams, making it wavier, making us have all these extreme weather events. And now with the missing Antarctic sea ice, it looks like Antarctic temperature amplification is rapidly rising. And that sea ice, if we're missing 2 million square kilometers in Antarctica sea ice, It has a bigger effect than missing 2 million square kilometers in Arctic sea ice because it's at much higher latitude. So the solar radiation intensity on it is much that much higher. So this is what we're finding now, you know, as we go into southern hemisphere summer, I guess. I I guess I think really amazing, frightening things are going to happen in the next uh, six months to a year from all of these factors you've talked about in your paper, but also things like the Antarctic sea ice, maybe maybe the methane acceleration from the wetlands, et cetera, et cetera. So I, th- I think your paper is very, very timely and very, very important. I think you're working on another one on sea level rise uh, updates. Is that correct? And also maybe talk about your book. I've been very anxiously yeah. awaiting your Sophie's oh. uh, planet and my bookseller keeps telling me, oh, it's been put off, you know, it won't yeah. be published for a while. And I know you got yeah. a lot on your plate, but I mean, this yeah. book, how, how, how similar is it to Storms of Our Grandchildren? Many people remember that book. And I checked the date. That yeah. was published like a decade ago. Yeah, more than a decade ago. Yeah, well, more this, than a decade ago. So. Sophie's Planet was delayed by this paper, which actually I started to work on more than two years ago. And it it changed, you know, uh, and and it, there was an additional six month delay. I decided to add in a section on Cenozoic climate change, which some readers said, "Oh, now it's too complicated. Nobody's going to read this paper. It's too much." <laughs> but it's actually very interesting. I found yeah. that uh, we d- didn't mention it in our webinar in our discussions it's just too many things in our yeah. paper but there is one really important conclusion because in looking at the entire picture of climate change not over not only since the last ice ages but over the entire 65 million years we have a coherent measure of the temperature change and we can convert that to an estimate of the co2 over that time frame And it's pretty clear that at the time that Antarctica glaciated, CO2 amount was only about 450 ppm. So the ice sheet models tell you that, oh, they need 800 ppm in order to melt Antarctica. Well, that's not what the real world is telling us. It's more sensitive than the models. And that's another important conclusion, which I, we need yeah. to look which, at that which, Cenozoic era. It's, it's There's a lot of information in uh, all of that. So the, yeah, the Cenozoic, I saw your comment in your letter uh, from just a couple of days ago, where you said that's one of the most interesting and important parts of your paper, um, global warming in the pipeline, but nobody's really see, seeing that yet. But it is fascinating. So so your book, so Well, planet. you know, let me say one thing about the oh, Cenozoic. Okay. Okay, because, yeah. you know, actually, in I first looked at the Cenozoic in 
conjunction with the paper uh, target CO2, what should we humanity aim for? And we concluded that the target that had been talked about then, 450 ppm, was actually way too much. And it should be less than 350 and maybe significantly less than 350. That was when I, you know, I managed to get some really great scientists to be co-authors on that paper. Jim Zakos is the, yeah. the world's expert in Cenozoic and deep ocean uh, sediment cores and interpreting the complex physics, chemistry, biology, uh, what those cores yeah. contain. And so it was fantastic. I learned so much from him. He's he's very modest, a soft-spoken <laughs> guy, but he's very smart. Mm. Anyway, what was my point? Oh, so the point was, in that paper and in the, my book, Storms of My Grandchildren, I argued that the Cenozoic temperature change, which had a peak 50 million years ago when India crashed into Asia, and then subducted underneath Asia and continues to put out CO2, Which but at a, decline, at a declining amount. So the temperature has gone down for the last 50 million years. And so in our present paper, we talk about, gee, could it have continued down and we go to a snowball earth, even though the sun is steadily getting brighter? Well, it's now an academic question because humans yeah. have now totally overridden uh, natural yeah, we've, climate. We've, we've, but what we did show in this new paper is that as India was moving through the Indian Ocean, it stopped or slowed down. And so the emissions would have decreased as it was subducting this uh, carbon rich uh, o ocean floor under the continent. Mm -hmm. And the CO2 and the temperature shows it just coincides with the change of the speed of the Indian plate. And so it sort of confirms that's really the main factor that was driving this whole last 65 million years. Yeah, yeah, the interaction of earth processes, uh, volcanic processes, continental right. drift with, uh, you know, carbon uh, yeah. being sequestered and, and released into the atmosphere. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. So. I mean, basically, I think this paper is, is uh, as you use the term uh, BFD, defining it as a, it's a big deal. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, the BF, the big deal is this yeah. sudden increase in absorbed solar radiation. Yeah. You know, if this, if this is a single event, which is just going to continue now, and if anything, get a little larger, yeah, it's a big deal. Yeah, if yeah. We, it, if we it, say, okay, we're going to counteract that by sucking some CO2 out of the air, well, it would cost more than a hundred trillion dollars at the current estimated yeah. cost. So, it's not happening. Yeah, and we don't have, uh, you know, that's the, the, we, those technologies. We haven't demonstrated they're, they're scalable at all or anything else. So. I still think uh, I, I still talk about what I call the three-legged bar stool: slashing fossil fuel emissions, carbon dioxide removal that includes methane removal, and uh, solar radiation management. Call it the ant uh, artificial anthropogenic volcano or something. You know, yeah. release some sulfur in the atmosphere to counteract some of this stuff. I mean, we can easily take sulfur out of shipping fuels, right? We don't need. There's no controversy about that, but we try to replace what we've taken out by putting some sulfur in the atmosphere and then the whole world is into a big co controversy saying oh gee you can't do that geoengineering and so yeah. on. anyway before i forget your your book okay sophie's planet tell us a little bit about your book is it going to be like storms of my our, our grandchildren yeah. part two or is it mostly sort of your journey and climate uh, change and your family it's <laughs> well, it's a pretty autobiographical, but the idea is to try to get more people to understand what's going on. Because the way I look yeah. at it, this decade is going to be the crucial time because here we are going to see more and more climate change. And people will realize that we don't want this to get yeah. greater. And so we've got to come up with policies 
this decade, or it's going to be too late to prevent the Western Antarctic ice sheet from ending Mark. up in the ocean. Yep. So this is a really critical time. And I hope that I can, with the book, I can make it a little more understandable, but it's hard. I mean, it's, yeah. it's yeah. difficult. Yeah, I remember years ago when you were arguing that we could have five meters of sea level rise by, you know, 2100 sort of thing. And, you know, I think, uh, I mean, it, the, the model, you know, the, the IPCC, the whole process just doesn't seem to be, it might be, a, the whole thing might just be counterproductive. I don't know. It's like we need an update, you know, on the real time updates or something or yearly updates to the IPCC reports. Right, the whole yeah. idea of a massive report every five to seven years. Well, by the time you get it out, you know you're way behind the eight ball. It, things yeah. are already changed, you know, yeah. far more. We we, we could spend uh, an <laughs> hour on the topic of scientific reticence, but yeah. but I'm actually going to have to run because I have an interview yeah. with Beijing News. So ah, okay. So yeah, that's another thing. We yeah, should be, yeah, no, we it, should it, be it, working it, with China instead of painting them as the enemy. Yeah. But, yeah, I, um, yeah. Anyway, I've got to run. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. James Hansen, for um, giving us uh, some of your valuable time to, to the Climate Emergency Forum uh, to allow us to delve into some of the questions and things that your uh, most recent paper, Global Warming in the Pipeline, have, uh, have discussed and, and, and found out because you know, a lot of the findings show that the, you know, we know people just looking out the window and seeing what's happening to our planet. We know that the warming seems to have been accelerated greatly in the last few years, and it's causing all kinds of uh, mayhem. And, uh, you know, your paper very clearly explains uh, the different physics components that could lead to uh, fewer clouds uh, from few, from fewer aerosols and, and things like that to, to greatly accelerate the, the warming. So your your contribution to climate science is vital, I think, and uh, a lot of the mainstream science um, is just um, is just plain wrong and needs to be updated to the present reality of how quickly our, our planet is warming. So thank you again for coming on Climate Emergency Forum. And uh, I want to thank our listeners for tuning in and please go and hit the subscribe button and share this video um, with your friends and colleagues. You know, this is very important information on the climate, which we need to get widely disseminated. So thanks again for, for, um, for, for your time in, in watching our videos on, on the Climate Emergency Forum.